Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second video lecture of our lecture one, which is risk and trust in computer systems. Uh, if you remember, we left from here. Uh, I, I wanted to give you some examples about threats and assets in a, a computer and network system. Uh, before uh, going forward, I just want to uh, review this uh, kind of basic and important uh, chain of definitions that we have, and we talked about it. Uh, we said that uh, in a computer system, uh, we have vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities uh, refer to the weaknesses that we may have in our computer system, and the weaknesses might be exploited later in order to trigger a threat, and then we said that after vulnerabilities, we have threats, which are the events or situations at which we have potential uh, negative impact. We may uh, encounter a negative impact uh, into our system, and uh, that negative impact may uh, try to alter one of those five security pillars that we counted. And then if an attacker comes and uh, tries to actively use that threat against us, uh, he or she is in fact attacking us and a real attack is being done into our system. Okay, uh, with this uh, kind of review, now let uh, continue our discussion and talk about uh, a list of uh, assets and different threats that might be uh, defined on them. Okay. If you remember, we said that the assets of a computer system, they may be hardware, software, data or information, and also any type of services. That here uh, as a services, we are talking about network level services, communication links and networks. Okay, uh, at the hardware level, the first uh, type of attack, uh, we may uh, have something like this. This is a threat that is going to, at the end of the day, alter the availability of the system. Uh, and you, if you remember, these were the three, three of those five pillars of the security, confidentiality, availability, and integrity that we call them CIA. And uh, two others are accountability and authenticity uh, that I said later, uh, they're, um, they've been added by uh, researchers. Okay, at the hardware domain, uh, for example, let's assume that the hardware equipment is stolen by someone or is disabled by someone. Okay, the stolen device or the stolen hardware, it might be, for example, a flash disk or any other type of hardware. That, of course, uh, one uh, immediate uh, negative impact of this thread uh, is that our system now is losing its availability. If someone needs to, you, to use or work with that specific hardware, that hardware is not available, is not ready for use. So the system availability is compromised. Or uh, another example, another threat example that alters the confidentiality is listed here. For example, assume that direct memory access component in a computer system is compromised by someone. And so that the data uh, in the memory now can be read by adversary person or by someone which is not authorized. So of course, this is a threat that may uh, alter the confidentiality. The reason we say this is a threat uh, is that we are at the time that we don't have an attack. No one has already used this, this uh, vulnerability in order to uh, actually attack us, but it may or may not happen. That's why we say this is a threat, and that threat is going to alter the confidentiality. And the third example is the case that, uh, for example, one of our, uh, one, let's say our configuration memory in our computer is being altered. The configuration memory is a part of memory that keeps the uh, information about the whole system. For example, how many IO devices we have, what are the, uh, intra vector addresses that we are going to use in our system. Or for example, uh, what uh, range of memory or let's say hard disk address is the part that we are storing the operating system at. Uh, or information like this, which are not the uh, exact user information or data, but their configurational data. If, uh, if those type of information 
uh, if uh, that type of information is altered in our system, what we are losing by that thread is the integrity of the whole system. Okay, at the software level or for software assets, uh, we can point to these three examples. Example one, threat one, is the case that programs are deleted or uh, denying access to, to the user or to, to a legit or uh, authentic user. Of course, this is something that alters the availability of our system. Or, uh, um, yeah, uh, let's say for example, and um, for the confidentiality, uh, we have uh, an unauthorized copy of a software in our system. Someone made an made a copy of the of a program or or of a process in the memory, and of course uh, that copy is in uh, is in fact altering our confidentiality because we said confidentiality means that uh, only authorized users should should be able to should be allowed to make copy or of the information or read the information. And thirdly, uh, for uh, integrity, for example, this is a uh, example thread that alters the integrity. A working program is modified either to cause a fail during the execution or to cause it to do something unintended. Um, a program is changed so that uh, it uh, fails when it's wants to be executed by the user or it performs something else. It, even it may, may uh, perform its actual or intended task, but it may uh, perform some extra tasks which are for malicious activities. They're all uh, affecting the integrity of our software asset. For the data, uh, examples for the data are um, very kind of, uh, uh, more sensible. Uh, for the data availability, for example, we can point to the cases that files or information in the memory are deleted or access to the file or information that our user need them is uh, not being issued. These are the cases that the data assets, they lose their availability. Uh, confidentiality, it, it refers to any example or any case that someone is able to read the data which is not allowed to do. I mean, the person is not allowed to do that. So an unauthorized read of the data is performed. That's of course a violation of the confidentiality of a data asset. Uh, this, may be, uh, this may happen directly. I mean, um, the attacker person or the threat, because here again, we are, uh, we are at the uh, threat domain. So, and we are not saying that we shouldn't say attacker. So the threat might be uh, because of some flaw that we have our system. So the data can be read directly, which is um, the easiest case for the attacker or uh, there are some information leakage so that the attacker can perform some statistical analysis in order to reveal the actual data. So the data itself is not directly available, but the data can be revealed through some analysis. We have some, some types of, type of attacks that work based on a statistical analysis. For example, uh, we have side channel analysis attacks that they look at the, for example, let me say, look at the sound that the computer system makes or the electromagnetic uh, emissions of a computer system and try to understand something out of that. It may, at the uh, uh, first glance, it may kind of seem uh, a little bit fiction, but it's actual. There are many papers, many researchers that they, sh uh, that they show, uh, they, they could actually uh, discover secret information by just listening to the electromagnetic uh, emissions of a computer system or the power consumption of a system. And of course, it's not easy. There's, there are heavy statistical analysis uh, that they should be applied on the data in order to uh, reveal the secret data or the protected data. Anyway, and uh, for the data assets and integrity loss, uh, any existing files are modified or new files are fabricated. This, this of course is an example 
uh, of a threat that is uh, going to, at the end of the day, alter the integrity of our data. And for network and communication lines, as a, as a candidate of services, that we, count the, we counted the services as the fourth assets in a computer system. Uh, but of course, network communication is one of the examples of the uh, services. Availability and message uh, or messages are destroyed or delayed. If a message is delayed, it means that you have your network connectivity, but for example, it was supposed to be, let's say, uh, 25 megabits per second or 100 megabits per second, but now it is only giving you one megabit per second. So you don't have the availability that you uh, normally expect to, to see. Confidentiality, some over the network, some messages are read. They are not being changed. The messages uh, are delivered correctly without any tampering, without any change but someone has read the, your messages. This is a potential case that may later be used to implement an attack. And this is a case that alters the confidentiality of our network services. And if the messages are being modified or reordered or duplicated, or in general, we say if they tamper, uh, that's the case that, uh, let me write you this. Yeah, tampering is the case that uh, if the messages are being tampered, we say that this is the case that the integ integrity of our uh, communication lines and networks as a representative, representative of, our, of our services are being uh, altered. Okay, um, after this example, now let's uh, talk about countermeasures. We have already talked about countermeasures, but now I want to make it kind of more clear and go uh, into more detail. First of all, uh, let kind of revisit the definition. We define uh, countermeasures as any uh, any try, any uh, tool, any algorithm, any extra hardware, any method, whatever which are being developed to deal with security attacks. So like I said, it might be algorithm. A countermeasure might be algorithm, might be a hardware architecture, might be, uh, let's say a software program, might be some type of data, for example, hashing or encryption or whatever. Some function, uh, some functions that work on the data and change the appearance of our data. All of these can be uh, somehow make some barriers uh, from the for the attacker in order to prevent the attacker from uh, being able to successfully accomplish the attack. So we implement, we develop. Uh, the countermeasures in order to deal with the security attacks that uh, compromise the security of our system. So by this definition, we can say that the duty, the main duty or the main goal that we expect to see from our countermeasures or any countermeasure is to uh, prevent the attack. Of course, this is uh, obvious that we cannot uh, come up with one single countermeasure that prevents all different types of attacks. And it makes sense if we say that for different types of counter, sorry, different types of attacks, we need different types of countermeasures. This is something uh, understandable, but the ideal goal or the ideal uh, aim that we expect to see from our uh, countermeasures is that they prevent the attack from being su successfully done. And this is uh, something that sometimes it happens but sometimes it doesn't. So the secondary goal, if the prevention doesn't happen, if the prevention uh, is not fulfilled, we expect from, this, uh, from a countermeasure to detect an attack and recover the system from the attack. So this is the, this is the primary goal that we expect from, our, from, from a countermeasure, prevention from preventing the attack. And if the prevention is not 
feasible is not achievable by that specific countermeasure, we try to detect, or sorry, we expect from the countermeasure to detect and then recover from that attack. And uh, next thing about countermeasures that we need to know is that it is not always that easy that we say, okay, we have a system which is uh, susceptible or vulnerable towards some specific attacks. Let's let develop some countermeasure and make and improve the security of that system. Of course, if you have your system A, and which is, let's say, uh, vulnerable to some attack A, let's say attack one, you patch the system, you add something to this, let's say countermeasure one, of course countermeasure one will improve the security of this system against attack one. This is obvious, but the problem is the countermeasure itself may introduce new vulnerabilities and may end up uh, putting the system in a situation that more attacks, for example, without this countermeasure one, the system was only susceptible to attack one, but adding countermeasure one, it helps the system or protects the system from attack one, but it introduces two no, new more attacks, attack number two and attack number three to the system. So you see that it's uh, kind of, sometimes it's not easy to make sure. So the countermeasure itself may introduce, may uh, open doors to new vulnerabilities and, uh, and of course new threats and new attacks. Uh, how we deal with this, we look at the residual of vulnerability, the amount of, the total amount of vulnerability after uh, adding or uh, developing that countermeasure uh, plus or in comparison with before adding that countermeasure to the system. So what was the residual vulnerability of this system A without countermeasure? Let's say that's some amount. And then what's the residual vulnerability uh, after adding that countermeasure? You remember we talked about risk measurement. We need to somehow, that's, that's, that's uh, here one reason that why do we need to, uh, to be able to do risk measurement? and risk assessment because um, I'm, an, I'm a security engineer. I think that my idea is great and it prevents the system from one specific attack. Yes, you're right. Your idea is great, but you're introducing new types of attack to the system that overall, I prefer not to use that idea because it puts me in a situation that now I'm vulnerable to two more attacks. So that's why we, we need to look at the residual vulnerability. So, and the goal in uh, security approaches is that we want to uh, make sure that the residual level of risk is reduced. So we want to, every time that we add a countermeasure, we want to make sure that the residual amount of risk is uh, at least reduced to some extent. Of course, we are talking about risk to the assets that we have in our system. Okay, now let's talk about a general model or general security model that for a computer system. Uh, here is a, a computer system uh, that at which we have two computers, uh, computer num number one or system number one, let me put it this way, computer system num number one and computer system number two, which are connected through some uh, network channels. It might be uh, wired or wireless. Uh, from from our point of view, it, it doesn't matter, uh, whatever. Here we have some users that the users, here are the users. Uh, users make some requests to system. And the processes on behalf of, on behalf of the users, uh, here are the processes and we define the processes. We said that the processes are in fact applications or programs under run. Applications or programs that they take CPU time and CPU is currently uh, executing them. Uh, the details, it depends on the system. It might be multitasking, it might be time sharing or whatever, but they are under run. They're alive, uh, they're live uh, programs. 
Okay, here we have processes that they, on behalf of the users, uh, uh, try to make some requests toward the data that we have in our system. And here is the data. Okay, let me clear uh, stuff and then, Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, here, uh, like I said, uh, we have this component. Uh, in this uh, general security model, we say that uh, we have four major components. First of all, we have users. Um, or let's go with the number, or maybe, maybe this is a kind of nicer flow. Uh, this is the numbering comes from the book, but I prefer this uh, ordering. We have the users, like I said, and the users um, are, of course, they want to uh, request for some access to, to some of the assets that we have our system. So, of course, the users need to be authenticated. So, we need some type of authentication in order to understand that, in order to guard or make, make the user request uh, secure. After that, we have processes uh, that processes want to request the data, request some, some data in our system. So the access to the data from our processes should be also protected, should be controlled or protected. Here is not authentication. It's, uh, there are some other issues. For example, here, it, it should be uh, synchronization. It should be accountability and integrity and other stuff. The data itself, number four, talks about the data itself. Uh, that of course, I'm um, in a portion of the, in the data that we have. Some portion of the data are sensitive data, and they should be stored uh, in a secure manner. They should be kept secure in order in, in a way that it we make sure that uh, the data is confidential and the integrity of the data is maintained. And finally, if there is any communication between two computer systems over the network channel, the communication over the channel should be uh, also go, um, should be guaranteed. It should be secure. So, uh, in this general model, we have four major security components: users, user, uh, users' accesses should be secured, should be uh, authenticated. Processes' accesses should be secured. Data should be kept in a secure manner and communications over the network channel should also be kept secure. Okay, uh, so um, now I'm, I'm going to talk about the uh, functional requirements for countermeasures. Uh, of course, uh, we have our computer systems and of course there are some vulnerabilities and after that, threats come and there are some attacks. Uh, again, we can, um, of course, point to many noun attacks. Uh, and for them, people uh, or researchers have thought and they have came up with many countermeasures. But is there any, uh, let's say, set of, is, is there any set of guidelines for developing countermeasures or not? I'm a security researcher and I'm going to uh, think about a security problem or security solution, sorry, security situation. And I'm going to uh, propose or develop some countermeasure. Is there any guideline for me that helped me uh, to make sure that my countermeasure is to some extent valid? The answer is yes. Um, NISC, National Institute of uh, Security and uh, Standard and Technology, sorry, they have released a, a standard called FIPS 200. And in this FIPS 200, they count 17 security related areas that they, they should be considered while developing countermeasures for security uh, problems or security while developing security solutions. Uh, in not in all cases we can consider all 17 uh, areas. Some of them doesn't make sense for some situations, but we we should be considering as much as uh, um, as much as of them that they 
kind of apply to our uh, security situation and security situation. The first, uh, okay, now I'm going to go over the most important uh, kind of guidelines for the countermeasures by FIPS 200. I'm not uh, listing all of the 17. I just uh, kind of list for you the most important ones. Okay, the first one talks about access control. It says that if you're developing a security countermeasure, and if, it apply, if it's applicable to your system, you should be checking for uh, kind of, you should be somehow uh, offering some access control methods. It means that only limited or authorized users or processors or devices or processes, we call all of these together, we say agents, you remember. Only authorized agents should be able to uh, access the restricted or sensitive assets. Not all agents are allowed. If that's applicable, uh, when we say if that's applicable, it means that if you have more than one user, which is the, um, uh, the uh, case for many situation, you have to have some type of access control. The second uh, kind of guideline talks about awareness and training. It says, if uh, your security situation is, uh, is for example, uh, information organization, a big organization that has many, like for example, let's say ANT, that you have many users, they have multiple security policies and they everybody has its own sensitive data. In that case, you need to work on the awareness and training, both of them. Make sure that all of your managers and users they're aware of the security risks that, um, uh, which is uh, related to their activities. Make sure that all of them are uh, aware of uh, the applicable laws, regulations, and policies. And also, you should make sure that uh, the users and managers are trained adequately. They know the information they need to know. Uh, we, we can't just easily, just simply come and ask them, okay, you should know that, for example, you uh, you have to, uh, let's say, protect your password. We need to uh, train people. We need to train the users. And of course, uh, for our countermeasure, we need to consider this if this is applicable. Uh, the third kind of uh, guideline talks about auditing and accountability. It says that, uh, if that's applicable, your uh, countermeasure should create, protect, and retain information system uh, audit records to enable monitoring. We need to record the data for monitoring, analysis, and investigation, and reporting uh, the malicious activities. These are the things that we expect from, uh, from a secure system, or FIPS 200 expects from uh, a, a secure uh, Counter, a security countermeasure. Ensure that the actions of individual information system or the organization users can be uniquely traced. This is uh, that accountability that we have uh, talked about. Make sure that if you have some users, make sure that you can trace back the activities and say, okay, uh, the person that you has kind of violated uh, policy number one or number two is this specific person. And that violation happened at this time by this specific action, for example. Okay, the next thing uh, that uh, we should be considering in while developing security countermeasures is contingency planning. Of course, uh, we cannot make sure that, or we cannot claim that our system is 100% secure. If someone comes to you and say that, okay, this system is 100% secure, of course that person is uh, ignoring some attacks or some situation or cases are kind of missing. So there are, there are situations that even though we have done everything that we have thought, but the system might be compromised. So what is our plan for, uh, for example, recovering or emergency responses? How, how are we going to back up the data or the operations in our system? This, this is something that is, which is called contingency plan. And we, while developing countermeasures, we have to have 
uh, we need to think about contingency planning as well. Identification and authentication. Um, again, which is very clear, it talks about authentication. If you have multiple users in your system, you should be able to authenticate your uh, users and processes. Of course, in general, again, we, uh, we should be able to authenticate our agents. Means that our users and processes uh, that work on behalf of our users. Uh, it's not only our users, uh, but for example, when you log in into uh, your ANT account, uh, whatever you do is traceable. Uh, there might be multiple. Uh, there might be multiple uh, processes uh, that you start running them, but all of them are uh, all of them are working on behalf of you, and all of them are somehow associated to you. So they are uh, authenticated because of you. So this is identification and, uh, and authentication. Yeah, incident response. Okay, if something happens, uh, which uh, we are not, um, we normally don't expect, uh, what, how are we going to handle that incident? Uh, how are we going to, for example, uh, detect the attack, analysis, that analyze the attack, do containment? Containment means that we, of course, don't want to let, let an attack to propagate through the whole system and, for example, let's say, uh, involve 100 users or 1,000 users. We want to uh, limit the, uh, uh, the range of the attack as small as possible. That's containment. And recovery, how are we going to do recovery? And all of these things are related to incident responses. And again, we, we want to, of course, be uh, tracked, be able to track the events and document them and report the incident. Maintenance, which is clear, of course, if uh, when you're talking about the secure system, you should be uh, doing periodic maintenance uh, in order to make sure that everything is uh, in a way that it should be and provide for that maintenance that first of all, that should uh, happen periodically on, on a kind of um, given uh, amount of time every, for example, let's say every week or every two, um, two weeks or whatever. And other than that, uh, in the countermeasure, we should be also providing effective uh, tools and techniques and me mechanisms uh, to the personnel that they're going to conduct the maintenance. Okay, maintenance, when we say maintenance, it doesn't mean that just I send someone that, it, that he or she doesn't have enough uh, tools or enough uh, skill uh, to, to perform the maintenance. We should do the maintenance periodically plus providing whatever is needed for a meaningful maintenance. Okay, the next guideline about developing countermeasure is physical and, and environmental protection. Uh, I've, I've already talked about physical protection. I, I've told you that, for example, one easy solution or one easy attack to an uh, important server is that I go there and just shut down the server. I don't need to even know the concepts, the minimum concept, concepts of security or computer networking or whatever. I just unplug the system from this uh, power supply. So that's why uh, in the FIPS 200, they also talk about physical and environmental protection. They say, uh, if that applies to your system, you have to limit the physical access to the information system and the equipment uh, and the environment uh, that your, your equipments are uh, kind of located at, only to authorize individuals. Protect even uh, even uh, other, on top of that, you also need to protect the physical plant and the utilities around your uh, sensitive equipment and sensitive computer system. And protect information system against environmental hazards. This is again, if you remember, I said that uh, sometimes they may happen naturally or uh, maliciously. Uh, even though if they happen naturally, for example, power supply disturbances that we talked about it, it may happen naturally, but uh, it's somehow affecting the security of our system as well. So we should also protect our system 
uh, against environmental hazards as well. And planning, uh, of course, another uh, uh, guideline for countermeasure development uh, that says develop document, develop document and periodically update and implement security plans. We have to have security plan. A security plan uh, tells us that how the security of our system is being uh, assessed and what are our security goals. Are we going to keep, for example, the security or the, let's say the risk uh, factor of our system at the same or we are, we are for example, uh, aiming to reduce it over time? So this is two different things. If you say that this is my system and I have already uh, paid some, some amount of money and I made it secure against, let's say, a list of 100 different attacks and my risk factor is something. And I'm not going to uh, improve the security. I just want to keep it the same. That's one goal or one plan. Another plan is uh, you say that this is my risk of my system at this time. At, uh, at the time of now, and I'm willing to reduce the risk of my system, uh, for example, to something below 5% over a period of two years. So uh, you see that, of course, these plans uh, are different. Personal security, uh, we need to ensure if it's applicable and we are developing a countermeasure, we should consider the security personnel as well. It means that we should ensure that the individuals in uh, different positions uh, and also the third party person or services that they provide some of the services to are, they are trustworthy and they meet uh, the required levels of security in their position. Uh, ensure that the systems are protected during and after the uh, personnels are current that um, are being uh, terminated or they're being transferred. Of course, uh, you, you have a, this is of course, uh, this, this kind of um, guideline uh, applies uh, uh, when we are talking about a big organization and we care about the security of the organization. Uh, it says, okay, you have different personnel. Some of them may join you and some of them may leave your company, may go to a different uh, job. So at the time that they're in their position, we should make sure that they are, they know their responsibility and they have enough knowledge about the security risk and uh, security uh, responsibilities that they have. And also we should make sure that once they are joining and leaving, everything is uh, okay. And we have to have enough security sanctions or security penalties uh, if an employee uh, violates some of the security policies or procedures of the system. Risk assessment that we talked about it, we should, we should be periodically assessing the risk of the uh, computer system or uh, in this book, we also sometimes see that it says uh, organizational operation or uh, information organi organization. It, that makes sense because your computer system might be a very big computer system that it, uh, let's say, hosts thousands of or 10,000 of different users. That's in that case, it's not a, a simple uh, system, it's an organizational system. But anyway, we should be periodically assessing the risk in, in our computer system or in the organization that we care about is security. Uh, over different assets that we have in the system or in our uh, organization. And finally, uh, the last criteria talks about the system and services acquisition. Uh, it says that if you are developing a countermeasure, of course, you need to allocate enough amount of resources to that uh, countermeasure. When you are developing a countermeasure, that countermeasure, for example, you want to protect the data, you say that I'm going to uh, use some encryption. We, we will be talking about encryption in detail, but encryption, for example, some of the noun one, uh, you have probably heard about AES, Advanced Encryption Standard. This is one encryption algorithm. Yet it uh, takes your data and it scrambles the data in a way that the data cannot be, that original data cannot be retrieved. Uh, 
So if you want to use encryption as one of your countermeasures, of course, you, know, you have to have process, you have to have some AES codes implemented. It might be a software version of AES, or you may have a hardware accelerator that uh, performs the AES encryption algorithm for you. So you have to put enough resources for that. And uh, the second thing that we talked about it, again uh, in lectures of the previous video, uh, security needs to be considered while developing the system. Do not put the security as a secondary step after you finalize the design. No, that's not a, that's not a good thing to do. If you have security concerns, apply them in your design. In fact, change your normal design to a security aware design. This is a term that they say security aware design. Designs that they also care about security at the design time. Of course, uh, employ rest uh, apply restrictions on the installation and usage of software. You don't want to let everybody to come and install any application they want. Ensure that third party providers uh, employ enough security uh, and they kind of meet the minimum security uh, levels that you expect. These are, uh, I guess, um, so, um, the most important as guidelines for developing uh, countermeasures for security uh, situations. Okay. Now, uh, the next uh, thing that I'm going to talk about is the fundamental security design principles. We have some security situation or security problem, and we have those guidelines in mind, uh, and we want to design our countermeasure. We want to develop our countermeasure. Of course, those guidelines, there are somehow uh, functional requirements that uh, I want to see them at the end of the day uh, when I've developed the countermeasure. My countermeasure is something, and that countermeasure, for example, need to uh, make sure, yeah, make sure that the personnel uh, make sure about the personnel security. But how should I approach this? How should I uh, implement this in my uh, countermeasure? For doing that, uh, there are some principles in the design of uh, countermeasures that we'll be talking about them. Uh, when we are designing security um, countermeasures, we should uh, be thinking about, we should be considering these principles. The first principle is economy of mechanisms. It says that think about the cost of your countermeasures or security solutions. They shouldn't be very complicated. Try to keep them as small as possible, as simple as possible. Because there are two good points about keeping the countermeasures small and simple. First of all, it is very, it would be easier to test and verify them. This is one good point about it. And the second, uh, they, if they are going to add some risk to your system, that added risk would also be minimized because the overall thing that you have added to the system is not that big. So economy of mechanisms, try to keep your countermeasures as small as possible. If, uh, or at least if you have two countermeasures that they, uh, their security um, achievement or security gains are similar, go with the smaller countermeasure or simpler countermeasure. The second principle in, this, in designing countermeasures is fail safe default. It says, if a countermeasure fails, design your countermeasure in a way that if that countermeasure fails, the system security is not compromised. Of course, this is not achievable all the time, but for example, one example is here. If you are uh, developing an authentication method, that authentication uh, and the authentication method should work based on approving or uh, 
not approving. I mean, it, uh, the default should be not approving. Everybody that comes to your system is uh, being kind of limited unless that person is approved or authenticated. So for example, the access decisions should be, uh, should be based on permission rather than exclusion. It means that every person uh, needs to be uh, permitted. So it means that if that, uh, this is your computer, and let's say this is your permission system, which is of course a part of this computer, but I uh, draw it in a different thing. Every user that comes, they need to ask permission from the, uh, from the authentication system. And if this authentication system fails, no one will get the permission. No one will have the chance to pass. So this is a fail safe. It means that if the permission system has failed, because you know, at the end of the at the end of the day, attackers may come and attack the authentication server or at authentication part of your computer. If that fails, everybody uh, will be. Of course, you will be losing the availability in this case. But it's better than to open the gate and everybody comes and reads the data and whatever. The next principle is complete mediation. Uh, it means that every uh, access must be checked against uh, the access control mechanism. Uh, what it says, it says that you shouldn't be uh, making decision, you shouldn't be using the previously made decision. For example, you have your authentication system here. User number one, user one has, uh, has came, has come, let's say yesterday, and this authentication system has approved this user and the user has entered. It, it, it happened yesterday. But now for today, this user number one again comes. The authentication server or the authentication part of our system shouldn't rely on the yesterday decision. The authentication process should be redone for this user this time uh, or any, any other time that this person comes. So we shouldn't rely on the memory or cache for authentication or any other security mechanism. It's, and this authentication here is just an example. Whatever we wanna do, we should do it every time for every user. Okay, the next thing is very important, the next uh, design principle, open design or open source design. It says this, uh, security countermeasures should be open source or open rather than secret. For example, you, you, of course, you know that we have encryption, you know that we have encryption methods. The encryption methods take the data and change the data or scam, scramble the data into something else. And you can never ever recover the original data from the scrambled data unless you have the encryption key. The encryption key is itself secret. You as a user, I as a user, we are supposed to keep the key secret. We shouldn't reveal the key to some to anyone. But the algorithm itself is not secret. Every, everybody knows how the AES algorithm works. It's actually online. You can go and uh, look at the details of this algorithm on Wikipedia. And this is the algorithm which is being used in uh, many of our, uh, for example, uh, credit cards and debit cards. Everybody knows the details of the algorithm. So the algorithm itself is not secret. The key is secret though, but the algorithm and any other countermeasures, the detail of the countermeasure should be open. It shouldn't be secret. So the, one big question is here, why? Uh, please pause the video here and try uh, and think about uh, why details of uh, any, any countermeasure, any security countermeasure should be open. Okay, I'm assuming that you have paused and you thought about it. Before going uh, forward, uh, today's, today's um, uh, uh, attendance code is my name, my last name, uh, all lowercase. My last name, all lowercase. Okay, why uh, we need to kind of consider this uh, open design principle? Because if we make something, if we have some uh, thing in our uh, uh, count, in our countermeasure, which is secret, and that secret brings some security for us. 
Okay, the next thing is that we need to somehow protect that. Who is going to, who is going to protect the AES documentation? For example, let's, let's say you came up with, uh, with then a specific authentication, uh, sorry, uh, encryption, and that encryption, let's say encryption X, Y, Z, it is, it, it is your own encryption. You say that, okay, this is this system is protected because it's using XYZ encryption and no one knows how XYZ works. Okay, how about if if the XYZ is very good and people will be uh, people is actually using it, now you are in a situation that you need to protect the documentation of XYZ. And if if that uh, that encryption is really great, uh, you can never ever keep that because someone they may come and physically. Uh, steal that thing from you, the documentation from you. So this is the idea. They say uh, we don't want to uh, shift the problem from one place to another place. We don't want to uh, shift the problem from securing uh, our system towards securing the, the, some documentation. Okay, the next uh, principle is separation of a privilege. Uh, or privileges, it says um, you have to have multiple separated privileges uh, in order to grant access to a user or to a restricted asset. You have asset, that asset is a sensitive asset for you. You don't want to give it to everybody, uh, but don't use a single uh, privilege or single factor to authenticate people. Ask multiple things and rely on multiple things. For example, you have seen in uh, many many uh, sites that you, or many accounts that you uh, you are uh, you might have online. Even if if you forget your username, they don't give, they don't give you the username easily because the username itself is something some privilege you you have you as a authenticated user or a legit user. You need to know first the username plus the password. So. That's two different things. I, I'm not gonna tell you what's the username. Least common mechanism. Uh, this principle says while developing a countermeasure, uh, minimize the functions shared between the users. If you have multiple users, don't use common functionalities or common functions because that may may make some problem for you. It may, uh, that way you can uh, easier provide mutual security. If you have seen a common function between user one and user two in a system, user one and user two, okay, user one may come with part of that information, user two may come with part of that information and it brings uh, or it opens uh, some doors for some specific attacks or vulnerabilities. Which, which of course incorporate more than one user. So try to avoid common uh, functionality or, mechan or security mechanisms. Okay, psychological acceptability. Your uh, security countermeasure should be psychologically acceptable. It means that it, sh it should be easy and people should, uh, should like to work with that. If it's uh, kind of making things uh, unacceptably difficult or complicated, people easily opt to turn it off. People just turn it off and then keep working. And that's against your basic idea. You just wanted to keep the, uh, make the system secure, but you're losing that. And then isolation, it says that it talks about multiple things. First, public asset, assets uh, uh, of a system should be isolated from the critical assets or critical resources. Of course, the public domain and the sensitive or secure domain, they shouldn't be mixed up. This is one thing, isolate these two. Second, uh, the, pro the agents in general, the agents should be isolated from each other. If you have one agent or one user and a second user, everything from these two should be separated. And finally, the security mechanisms or countermeasures themselves should be isolated. First of all, isolate the countermeasures from the public domain. And second, isolate the countermeasures from each other. 
countermeasure number one and countermeasure number two should be isolated. And lastly, uh, the final uh, design principle is uh, layering. It means that uh, use, we mentioned that you need, you need to have uh, multiple uh, kind of privileges in order to get access to a asset, a sensitive asset. But the layering says you, your countermeasures should be somehow backing up each other. There, of course, uh, uh, should be isolated, but it doesn't mean that they don't, uh, they, sh they shouldn't or they must not incorporate with each other. They, sh they should work in an overlapping mechanism. It means that if one of the, or one layer of the countermeasure fails, the other layers take care of that. They uh, take care of the system. This is uh, sometimes referred to as uh, defense in depth. It means that we have um, multiple layers of uh, countermeasures that each layer is protected by another layer. Okay. Uh, Uh, next thing is about uh, attack surface. Attack surface, uh, of course, um, we have vulnerabilities and we have threats and we have attacks, but um, are all of the attacks should be seen the same? No. Uh, vulnerabilities in a kind of specific domain, we call them a specific attack surface. All related vulnerabilities, which are reachable and exploitable in a given domain. For example, let me give you this. This might be a very nice kind of uh, categorization. We have some vulnerabilities at the network domain. For example, vulnerabilities in the, uh, let's say, some ports in our browser might be open, or some protocols might not be uh, might have some vulnerabilities. Or let's say our wireless connection is not, uh, has some vulnerabilities to some types of attack. All of these are somehow related to the network. So we call them network attack surface. All attacks and vulnerabilities related to network. We have software attack surface. Everything about every vulnerability which somehow relates to the software. And of course, we have human attack surface and a hardware attack surface, uh, which, which is not in our book, but we have also hardware attack surface as well. And it makes sense that we say these are vulnerabilities all related to human users. For example, how a human user may forget some of the security policies that we talked about it, or we uh, try to enforce in our system, but the user just forget that or how they may uh, misunderstand some security policy. These are all vulnerabilities uh, or how the people might be engineered in social media or any other uh, method, for example, phishing uh, emails or whatever uh, in order to uh, kind of violate some of the security policies that we have uh, implemented or we, we've tried to implement, in fact. Okay, here is the here is a chart that it says uh, the the attack surface might be large or small, and the, we may have layering in our uh, security countermeasures. The layering we may have no layering, or the layering might be shallow or might be deep. Uh, the worst case uh, situation is that uh, if the attack surface is small sorry, is large, is, it means that there are many vulnerabilities or multiple vulnerabilities and we don't have a uh, good layering in our countermeasures. In that case, the security risk is gonna be very high. In contrast, when the attack surface is small or uh, the system and or let's say, and or the system is uh, kind of uh, secured with a multi-layer uh, countermeasures or deep, uh, countermeasures. In that case, the attack, uh, the, the amount of risk that uh, we have in our system is going to be low. Okay, 
Um, we have a few few slides uh, left for this uh, lecture. Uh, I think it's only two, so ju just let me go uh, and finish them so that we finish this lecture on time. Uh, so um, this lecture might be a little bit more than 60 minutes, maybe let's say 65 minutes maximum. Okay, the last thing that we will be talking about is the security strategy. Uh, of course, when we want to make a, a computer system or information organizational system secure, uh, we first uh, define and implement security policies. Uh, it, of course, is a set of rules or procedures that we want to apply in our uh, system or in our uh, information organization. Uh, and those uh, kind of articulate the security restrictions or regulations that we have. And then after implementing security policies, we, we come and we actually implement the security solutions that we have. And of course, the security solutions or countermeasures, uh, they first try to prevent from the, att for the attacks. And then if they fail in this regard, we do the detection, response, and recovery. Uh, this is the security implementation, the actual implementation of the security. And then we have assurance. Uh, then uh, next step uh, is to make sure that this uh, security policies are enforced in a right way in our system. And lastly, we do the evaluation, which, which is basically, uh, we, we called it before risk assessment or something like that. We need to periodically come and ex examine our system, implement the, uh, or uh, conduct the risk, risk assessment. The risk assessment uh, or evaluation uh, may happen through some uh, mathematical methods, or formal analytic methods, or you may do some real testing. I'm sure that you have heard about penetration testing. Penetration testing is that you have your system, you wanna make sure about a security level. Let me just attack it. Um, they are called white hat attackers. White hat attackers, they are attackers that they come and try to attack your system and show you the vulnerabilities that you have. They don't wanna ransomware you, they don't wanna ask money, but they just want to show you that you have these vulnerabilities in your system. So that's what they do is that they do the penetration testing. So this is of course something good. If you know the vulnerabilities, you of course try to make the system uh, or try to patch them, try to develop some specific countermeasures for them, which is good. Okay, uh, we are done with our lecture, uh, with our video lecture. The last two slides of this lecture are standards. I'm not going to talk about them. I just list them here for you. Uh, a few of our standards come, uh, like I said, come from the National Institute of Standard and Technology, NIC. We also have uh, ISOC, Internet Society. Uh, some of our standards in the course come from International Can Telecommunication Union or ITU and International Organization for Standard, uh, Standardization, ISO. Uh, okay, thank you for, uh, for making today's class and uh, we are done with lecture uh, one. Uh, next week, we start our lecture two. Thank you and have a good day. Bye-bye.